Do you want to maximize your success with NCUA? Join Mark Trichel as he shares with you the insider's view on passing your exam with Flying Colors. The With Flying Colors podcast is sponsored by Credit Union Exam Solutions by Mark Trichel. If you would like to work directly with the Credit Union Exam Solutions team and receive support to optimize your results with NCUA so you save time and money, visit us at marktrichel.com to find out more. Hey, everyone. This is Mark Trichel with another episode of With Flying Colors. And the other day I came across a document from the office of the comptroller of the currency, which caught my attention. The reason it caught my attention is that it is a bank supervision operating plan for 2024, where they highlight what their examiners are going to focus on. And if you've listened to me here before, one of my favorite documents that NCUA releases is the priority letter to credit unions, which comes out late January. So uh, I I never could figure that out. Even when I was there, it was just, I guess it's something I should have changed when I had the opportunity, but it doesn't come out till January. They're already into the new year, about a month, and they launch this letter to credit unions with what their priorities are. And then they build it into the uh, CUNA GAC, which might be partially why they wait till January. Anyway, it's one of those, they've always done it that way. However, the OCC, here we are early October, they are signaling where they're going to go. And similar to the quote, history doesn't repeat itself. It certainly does rhyme. Regulators repeat themselves. They might not repeat themselves, but they certainly do rhyme. So there's, you can get some takeaways from looking at what the OCC is going to focus on. And you can see it's similar to what NCUA has focused on, but there's some interesting language here that I wanted to highlight. And in the show notes, I will include a link to the PDF of this document. And if you are interested, you'll be able to find the entire document there or by Googling the fiscal year 2024 bank supervision operating plan office of the comptroller of the committee on bank supervision. So what do they have here? on their priorities. Uh, I'm going to give you a highlight of what they have and then give you a little bit of information about each one. But first, they have asset and liability management. No shocker there. Second, they have credit. Third, they have the allowance for credit losses. Fourth, they have cybersecurity. Fifth, they have operations. Sixth, they have distributed ledger technology DLT-related activities. Seventh, they have change management. Eighth, they have payments. Ninth, they have BSA, have to include BSA. Tenth, they have consumer compliance. Eleventh, they have Community Reinvestment Act. Of course, credit unions don't have to do that unless they're in certain states such as Massachusetts, which require it of credit unions. I forgot what number I was on. Perhaps it's number 11, fair lending. And then lastly, climate-related financial risks. Those are the priorities for OCC other than CRA, which isn't required of credit unions. I could see NCUA touching on most of these. Uh, They tended to have a shorter letter more recently to focus credit unions on what is uh, the top priorities. And I think they did that because of interest rate risk and liquidity risk being so important last year. And as I've said, if, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So. I'm going to predict that when NCUA comes out with their letter in January, it won't have all of these on there, but let's go back to the top. So asset liability, asset and liability management. Here's what the OCC says examiners should do. Examiners should determine whether banks are managing interest rate and liquidity risk through use of effective asset and liability risk management policies and practices including stress testing across a sufficient range of scenarios, sensitivity analysis of key model assumptions and liquidity sources, and appropriate contingency planning. So with my client and my discussions with credit unions, I have seen credit unions being pushed to do enough stress testing and change their um, non-member deposit uh, studies to a shorter timeline because of what what has happened recently. I've seen that in examiner findings. I've seen that in as just suggestions and supplementary facts, and I've seen it in document resolutions. So NCUA is consistent there. 
Uh, the section goes on to say examiners should also determine whether a risk appetites and policies are consistent with projected risk to asset values, deposit stability, liquidity, capital, and earnings. Examiners should determine whether management sufficiently incorporates non-parallel rate scenarios in addition to more standard scenarios. So why did they do that? Of course, we're in an inverted yield curve, which oftentimes is what people say is the definition of a recession, but we've had an inverted yield curve for quite some time. Here on October 8th, that yield curve looks like it might be about to not be inverted with what's going on at the 10-year, the 30-year, and the five-year bonds. But anyway, interesting times as it relates to that, but it, they're wanting people to build in inverted yield curves into their scenarios. I wouldn't be surprised if NCUA starts looking at that as well. It goes on to say reevaluation of the timing and amount of deposit outflow assumptions under both idiosyncratic and systemic liquidity stress scenario analysis may be warranted based on recent market disruptive events. What market disruptive events might that be? Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, the failures back in March are driving where the OCC is saying banks should look at. And again, I know NCUA is cautiously nervous as it relates to this in credit unions. Of course, banks have more uninsured deposits than credit unions do. And that puts credit unions collectively and most of the times individually better positioned than banks in this regard. Uh, but you can continue to see NCUA looking at, um, asking credit unions to have one year forward uh, liquidity stresses. And one way to do that is to measure your standard, several standard deviations of what's happened over the last couple of years and build studies based on that and then build that into your, your forward looking cash flow projections to see if you have the acceptable uh, dry powder, if you will. Uh, the letter goes on to say supervisory focus should also include back testing practices to assess whether models performed accurately during recent stress events. Contingency funding should be reviewed, determine whether you have adequate operational readiness to access contingent funding sources, effective monitoring of established borrowing lines, good collateral management practices, and the ability to access contingency liquidity sources in an efficient and timely manner. Said another way, if you think you have a line of credit and you think you have the ability to go borrow, you really need to make sure you've got your ducks lined up and your paperwork done and that you're not trying to arrange to get them the proper collateral documentation, et cetera, et cetera while the event is going on because you could drown by not having enough liquidity, or I guess it would be the reverse of drowning if you drowning, if you didn't have enough liquidity. But CUA has also, as I've seen in exams and discussions with credit unions is pushing, making sure you have the adequate liquidity. One thing I've seen recently too is, well, not recently over the last year and a half is the use of shares, borrowings, and non-member deposits and uh, NCUA. You can tell NCUA first prefers member shares. Borrowings and non-member deposits are about tied for third, I would, I, I would say. But uh, the over-reliance on non-member deposits and over-reliance on borrowed funds is something that NCUA is trying to measure. And so you can expect them to push on that during the exams. Let's see, uh, rounding out this area, examiners should also assess whether contingent funding sources are sufficient to meet potential funding needs and periodically tested. So again, we're seeing that in credit unions as well. The second priority they have is credit. Examiners should evaluate the effectiveness of the institution's actions to identify and manage credit risk given significant changes in market conditions, interest rates, and geopolitical events. Examiners should evaluate bank stress testing of adverse economic scenarios and potential implications to capital. Areas of focus for stress testing reviews should include increasing operating and borrowing costs for vulnerable retail and commercial borrowers. Risk-based examination work should focus on concent concentration risk management, including for vulnerable commercial real estate and other high-risk portfolios. Risk rating, accuracy, portfolio of highest growth and new products. 
So what's growing the most, they're going to look at it. And CUA has a similar policy and anything new, they mention new products and CUA will look at new products. Uh, a lot of focus there on commercial real estate. You, know, you read the Wall Street Journal, you read Bloomberg, you see that there's some angst that there's losses that are going to be coming and or delinquency that'll be coming as five-year balloons on commercial real estate start, start to come due and reprice. And lo and behold, the businesses or the collateral or both are in different positions when that balloon comes due. So they're you can tell the way they've written this, that they're a little worried about that. Examiners should evaluate whether loss, loss mitigation practices, including forbearance and modification programs, consider borrowers' ability to repay and offer meaningful, affordable, and sustainable payment assistance. So NCUA, there's a, there is a joint letter to financial institutions on how to properly work out loans. And that's what they're referring to here, I believe. Examiners should determine whether bank risk management functions are providing a credible challenge, including the potential for additional adverse economic scenarios and their implications. So said another way, what happens if loan losses go up? What are your plans? What are your strategies uh, to keep the boat afloat? Next up is the allowance for credit losses. I'm going to, we've had Years and years of CECL preparation and credit unions appear to be doing rather well with that. And I've got nothing more to say as it relates to that, although it's third on the list for the OCC. Cybersecurity, cyber is always ever present in everybody's mind, whether you're sitting at your laptop or your iPhone or another type of phone, this is a continual battle. And it's what the NCUA board members, if you look at their speeches over the last couple of years, I believe all of them have said, I can't sleep at night because of cybersecurity threats. So you can continue to, I can guarantee you that that will be an NCUA's uh, priority letter that comes out in 2024. Next on the OCC list is operations. Examiners should identify and assess product services and third-party relationships with unique, innovative or complex structures such as real-time payments, banking as a service arrangements, distributed ledger related activities or use of artificial intelligence technologies. So I'm gonna guess that this is the first time artificial intelligence has woven its way into banking guidance because over the last year, AI, if you will, artificial intelligence has been the forefront of everybody's buzzwords. So the buzzwords has worked its way into this letter. Examiners should determine whether due diligence, ongoing monitoring processes and risk governance are commensurate with the nature and criticality of new modified or expanded products and services. In addition, examiners should assess the institution's risk management processes and controls of third party relationships, particularly those with financially, with financial technology, fintech companies to safeguard against operational, compl operational compliance, reputation, financial or other risk. Reviews of bank governance should assess the effectiveness of talent recruitment to include internal and when applicable third-party retention and succession management processes. So with all the technologies and all the companies that weave into giving your members service, all of those create potential risks. And that's what this is pointing out. And those risks as they relate to the accounting side of things are pretty scary or regulators. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to one of my previous podcasts, I discussed the fact that at the NCUSIF briefing on camel code increases in large credit unions, complex credit unions, those being over $500 million in assets, one of the board members asked the chief financial officer at NCUA, what was, what were the reasons for these? And there was references to liquidity, set, uh, rape sensitivity, management challenges, but they also talked about audits and record keeping issues. And which surprised me that we're talking about big institutions and those being what's driving camel downgrades. Well, you can link these operational issues and FinTech issues and real-time payments and banking as a service and distributed ledger related activities and AI, all of those, if they relate to accounting type issues and you're doing them wrong, you could expect NCUA to hit that real hard. And I think there's a lot of nervousness 
in banking regulators, including NCUA as it relates to that. Next up on the next up on the letter is distributed ledger technologies, DLT related activities. So of course this links to Bitcoin, et cetera. D DLT is the underlying architecture of Bitcoin. As I've learned from some of my other podcasts on the topic of Bitcoin and DLT, if you're interested in those, I've got two or three previous podcasts that touch on that. You can uh, check back on the history. Examiners should assess risk management processes for any DLT related products and services, including crypto asset custody, tokenization of real world assets and liabilities, payments, and other uses to support business operations. Reviews should include banks due diligence and risk assessments, including the integrity and control of distributed ledgers used. Governance structure, consensus mechanism, encryption methods to determine whether management has effectively identified and mitigated the risks. Examiners should also determine whether management has sufficient expertise to manage the technology and related financial, operational, compliance, strategic, and reputation risks. In addition, examiners should determine whether banks are following the supervisory non-objection process described in OCC's interpretive letter 1179 for DLT related activities. So in that regard, the banks are a little bit more aggressive on this topic and have put the clamps on banks more than NCUA has put the clamps on credit unions. In some ways that that is good. I know NCUA board member Kyle Houtman talks about it every time or quite frequently when he goes out and speaks that NCUA has a letter to credit unions saying that they want credit unions to have the ability to do it, just do it right. Hopefully credit unions don't get caught on the wrong side of this because just as the last category talked about, you know, third parties and fintech and how that can impact your, your risk there, this, if this is done wrong, it, it can blow up in your face. So it's going to be interesting to see where this plays out. And I'm not saying NCUA shouldn't take that approach, but I think it creates a few more risks for credit unions. Now, another wonderful topic they have here is change management. Examiners should identify financial institutions that are implementing significant changes in their leadership, operations, risk management frameworks, and business activities, including the use of third-party service providers that support critical activities. You know, I subscribe to The Motley Fool uh, to make some of my own personal investments, and one of the things they always look at is the stability of management. When they're recommending somebody... They have a specific category when they talk about the stability of management. How long has management been there? Were they the founder? How much do they own? Have they been selling stocks, et cetera, et cetera? So that's a little different, little bit different lens than how long has someone been at the credit union, but you get my point. If everybody's new, there could be some additional opportunities, but there could be some additional risk. And those changes uh, are something that examiners are going to be taking a look at, at least on the bank side of things. And I would imagine also at NCUA, although I doubt this will hit NCUA's letter to credit unions specifically that comes out in January. Examiners should determine the suitability of government processes, including acquisition or retention of qualified staff when the board or management undertaking significant changes. This includes changes resulting from mergers and acquisitions, systems, conversions, regulatory requirements, and implementation of new modified or expanded products and services, such as the use of technological innovations. So, yeah, and I've seen situations go awry, and I'm sure you have too, where mergers didn't go as well as they could, system conversions have not gone as well as they could. And, you know, the changes that come along with that being a little bit more complicated and with the vendors that you have being overworked, I've seen, you know, using that term loosely, I've seen situations where they haven't been able to come back and help someone after a conversion, et cetera. So that's another interesting item here in this letter. Payments examiners should identify and evaluate financial institutions, payment systems, and payments related products and services being offered or planned, especially new or novel products, services, or delivery channels, such as person to person payments. So you can think of the, what you got Venmo out there, you've got Zelle, and there is fraud around that. I recall hearing that Reddit, there were some Reddit posts that were out there telling people which banks and credit unions were easy to commit fraud on, on, on Zelle and on, I believe on, on Venmo as well. Examiners should consider 
potential operational compliance, credit, liquidity, strategic, and reputation risks, and how they are incorporated into financial institution-wide risk assessments. When banks have opted to use the FedNow payment system, examiners should assess banks' risk management policies, including governance and control of change management, information technology, information security, compliance, and fraud. So FedNow is going to become a bigger and bigger issue moving forward. So they've woven that in BSA. It's always there. It's always on NCUA's priority list. It'll be there again. And, you know, it's one area when you have issues and CUA has agreements with the other financial regulators that certain things will need to be treated as examiner findings. Certain things will need to be treated as document resolution and certain things might actually require a letter of understanding and agreement. So other than the fact that, you know, you have to be on top of that and non-compliance can be very expensive. Catching up can be very expensive. If you have issues there, I've seen some situations where NCUA has gotten pretty aggressive on that. So consumer compliance, I've talked a lot about consumer compliance as it relates to NCUA uh, board chairman, Todd Harper, and him being very passionate about that. President Biden dominating a new board member, Tanya Otsuka, who rumor has it could be coming on as soon as this month. And I did a podcast on that where Jeff Bacino believes it'll likely happen by the end of the year. But in any event, NCUA will have a broader footprint on consumer compliance because Chairman Harper is going to have a second vote. I believe you'll start to see things in the budget documents, which could come out as soon as, who knows, the NCUA board meeting is coming up in a week or two. But if they're going to stay on their normal target, they need to get the guidance out this month. They need to have a hearing next month, November, and they need to approve a budget the next month in December. So I would bet within the next two weeks, we see NCUA's budget document. And that will, as Wayne Gretzky says, skate where the puck is going. I will read that and tell you where the puck is going as it relates to that budget. But on consumer compliance, the OCC says examiners should focus on banks' compliance risk management systems for new or innovative products, expanded services, and delivery channels offered to consumers or that involve products or services offered through third-party relationships, including those with fintechs. As you can hear, fintechs comes up in most of these risks. Fintechs comes up in most of these risks, and it's clearly on the, on the frontal lobe, if you will, of the OCC right now or through banking as a service activities. Of course, that's where banks rent out their, their ability to clear checks, their routing number to other Novo banks, if you will. Examiners should also evaluate the effectiveness of compliance functions supported by third-party service providers. So just because you outsource it doesn't mean you're responsible to make sure those third parties are compliant. And you've seen some loan originators who've gotten beat up, beaten up on that. And just because you do indirect lending, it doesn't mean that you're absolved of what the indirect organizations are doing. And I did a podcast on that a couple months back. And if you're interested in how indirect loans are related to fair lending type issues, you can go back in the history and take a look at that. Supervisory focus should include bank processes to ensure compliance with statutory requirements prohibiting unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices, including review of risk management practices for overdraft protection programs with features that may present heightened risks such as authorized positive, subtle negative, or multiple represent, re, repre, representment fees. So NCUA just did a webinar on over, uh, which included a discussion on over overdraft protection programs. And they pretty much came out and said that authorized positive settle negative, which I understand is what a lot of credit unions do is violates the spirit of the credit union movement. So OCC is coming at this. Why? Because CFPB is coming at this. NCUA will come at this. They've been talking about it. And you can expect, I believe, that consumer compliance will move up in priority on NCUA's letter to credit unions, and it will be more robust. Even last year, if you, if you go back to what I said about this letter to credit unions, the most verbiage in any of the risk listed was in consumer compliance. So they used the most words, even though they had it near the bottom of the letter, uh, it had the most teeth and I'm expecting more teeth to be added when NCUA comes out with the letter. 
in late January of 2024. We'll see if I'm right. All right, where was I on this? Um, with increasing use of person-to-person -person payments, examiners should focus on compliance challenges, including fraud and error resolution. Okay, person-to-person, -person, that would be Zelle, that would be Venmo, that would be PayPal. Additionally, examiners should evaluate the due diligence performed on any prospective third-party relationship to this relative to the specific roles and responsibilities of the bank and the third party. NCUA has guidance on third party due diligence. It's really robust. It's relatively stale. It's, it's good guidance though, but the banks came out with, I want to say a hundred page guidance that NCUA is not part of. And if you're looking to beef up what you have, and again, expecting where NCUA might go, that's always something that you can just like, just as looking at this letter can provide some context on where you might want to go. It also, that's a document uh, that's worth taking a look at. The next is the CRA, skip over that. Fair lending examiners should focus on assessing fair lending risk and whether banks are ensuring equal access to products and services. Risk assessments should consider all factors that could affect a bank's fair lending risk, including changes to strategy, personnel, products, services. Underwriting systems, CRA assessment areas, and operative environment since the previous risk assessment. Additionally, unless deferred or waived, examiners must conduct fair lending examinations for focal points identified during OCC's 2023 20, annual statistical screening of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data or after assessing a bank's fair lending risk profile. Fair lending supervision activities should encompass a full life cycle of credit products, including the potential for mortgage lending discrimination resulting from appraisal bias or discriminatory property evaluations. So uh, appraisal bias, uh, it is, you know, if, if you, again, read Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, it's talked about a lot that depending on what type of neighborhood you live in, there could be appraisal bias that impacts particular races. And you can expect when NCUA does their fair lending exams, they're going to be looking at that. They are going to continue to increase their footprint. I believe they, right now, their plans are to do 24 to 30 of those per year. And I know they increased it a little bit last year or talked about increasing it, but you can expect that that footprint could double, triple, quadruple over the next one, two, and three years. All right, and we get to the last one, last but perhaps not least, depending on where you sit on this, climate-related financial risks for national banks, federal savings associations, and foreign banking organizations with over $100 billion in consolidated assets and any branch or agency of a foreign banking organization that individually has assets over $100 billion. So all of that said another way, if you're over $100 billion, examiners should monitor the development of banks' climate-related financial risk framework for safety and soundness and engage with bank management and other regulators to better understand the challenges banks face in this effort, including data and metrics, governance and oversight, policies, procedures, limits, strategic planning and scenario, analyses, capabilities, and techniques. So doesn't really say much there. It's kind of broad. Hey, we'll talk to you about it. I'm expecting that when the budget document comes out from NCUA, that the climate related risk issue will be in there. One of the things I do when there's words I'm interested in, of course, I read the whole thing, but I'll take, you know, I'll type in safety and soundness. I'll type in climate related. I'll type in FinTech and see where NCUA talks about it. It's a good way to look at that document and quickly see what's important. For example, if consumer compliance is in the document 47 times, that's different if it's in there two times. Climate-related financial risks will be in NCUA's budget. How they deal with it, I think, won't be too heavy-handed to start because they tend to realize they need to tiptoe into this, but they are going to tiptoe into it, in my estimation, a bit more next year. We'll see what that means. All right, so again, in closing on this document, they have a paragraph that says, supervision resources should focus on significant risks and the board and management's ability to control those risks while considering appropriate coverage of other areas. Examination activities should integrate multiple risk disciplines and include cross-disciplinary teams when feasible. That would be specialists from an NCUA perspective. To help provide a complete assessment of risk, strategies should focus on risk governance and control functions and leverage 
the financial institution's audit, credit risk review, and risk management processes when the OCC has validated their reliability, including scope, timeliness, and competence. So that's kind of the catch-all. You got to weigh all these other things while you weigh these 12, 11, 13 risks, however many there are. Like I said earlier, as Mark Twain said, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. You can apply that to the banking regulators. Banking regulators don't necessarily repeat themselves, but they certainly do rhyme. You can see many of these things, as I've discussed, weave their way into NCUA's guidance, NCUA's priority letter, which again will come out later this year. And some of it's already there, but you can see from what I've stated here, based on what the OCC has stated, there's some things here that I believe NCUA will um, piggyback off of, and we're probably already pr probably we're already planning to do so independently. But this is a a good foreshadowing of where the NCUA's priorities might be in 2024. All right, that's it. The Buffalo Bills are about to go off in uh, London to take on the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. Of course, my Minnesota Vikings are playing the Kansas City Chiefs in Minnesota. Hopefully that's not too brutal. It's been a rough year to be a Viking fan. That's it. This is Mark Treichel. I appreciate you listening. Signing off with Flying Colors. Thank you for joining us on this episode of With Flying Colors. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app to hear future episodes where subject matter experts of all varieties will provide tips on how to achieve success with NCUA. If you would like to learn more about how we assist credit unions, check out our services at marktreichel.com.